Let me just do some introductions first of all. I'm Justin Briley. Uh, this is my co-host Ruth Jackson, who's also with us to ask the questions of Bill. And uh, we're delighted to welcome you here today, wherever you're watching from in the world. If you'd like more from Unbelievable, then do look us up as a podcast on YouTube as well, or at our website, premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable, where you can also sign up to our newsletter. And by the way, if you're watching from the USA, we've a brand new website we'd love to connect with you on, unbelievable.show, where you can also sign up for updates and resources. Mm. All of the links are with uh, the info, with today's video, wherever you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Now to our guest, Dr. William Lane Craig, uh, one of the foremost Christian apologists in the world and the founder of Reasonable Faith. Uh, Bill is the author of numerous books and articles. He's debated many of the world's leading secular thinkers, uh, was once described by Sam Harris, no less, as the one Christian apologist who seems to have put the fear of God into many of my fellow atheists. Um, you can find out more about Bill at the website, reasonablefaith.org. Now, if you have a question for Bill today, we're doing an Ask Bill Anything edition of the show. Uh, do leave your question in the comments on Facebook, wherever you're watching on Facebook or indeed on YouTube. And we'll try and put as many of them as we can to Bill during the course of uh, this evening. We've already got some to start us off. Now, uh, Bill, you were last on the Unbelievable Show in conversation with theologian Greg Boyd, weren't you, debating? Yes, I remember that well. Yes, it, it's been a very popular video and podcast. Um, what, what are your thoughts sort of as you reflect back to that last, last time we had you on the show? Well, I thought it was a very ironic and profitable discussion of two quite different views of the atonement of Christ. And I frankly felt that I did a credible job of defending a classic Reformation view of the atonement, and that in many cases, I think Greg um, hadn't really explored the alternative as thoroughly as one might desire. So I hope it will be a stimulus to him I, to look I, further I, into it. As I said during the show, I was pleasantly surprised, actually, that there was quite a lot of common ground between you, more than I was mm. possibly expecting, actually. Um, and, and I think Greg did appreciate the way you had obviously outlined what he thought was one of the best defences of penal substitutionary atonement, um, as he said. Yeah. But um, that's that's the topic, obviously, of your latest book, Atonement and the Death of Christ. And if you haven't watched it yet or, or listened to it on the podcast, I do encourage you to go and listen to that in the Unbelievable Archive. It's only a couple of months ago we did that show. Uh, you may indeed have a, a question on that subject. Uh, Bill, though, turns his hand to all kinds of issues in philosophy and apologetics. Uh, so we welcome all your questions. Um, whether you think of yourself as a Christian or not, perhaps you're an atheist watching an agnostic, some other worldview, uh, all questions are welcome. As I said, we'll try and get mm. to as many as we can during the course of the show. Um, it has been a really strange year, as, as we all know. Um, have there been, though, amidst all the obvious difficulties, any highlights for you in the past year, Bill? Well, yes, because I have been so focused on my research and writing since I'm not traveling anymore. It's been an incredibly productive year for me, Justin. Um, I finished in the spring my two-year research project on the historical atom, and that was a very rewarding study for me personally, and I think a very important book on the historical atom came out of that, which will appear sometime next year. And then the other enormous step was that having finished the project on the historical atom, I began working on um, my magnum opus, so to speak, which will be a systematic philosophical theology summarizing my life's work. And uh, I've actually already begun to write on this. And so it's been really a very productive year in that regard. Yes, I mean, if, if actually, if you've, you might be able to answer one of our questions nice and early then, because Casey Peter Sandberg asked, when can we expect your new systematic theology? Do you oh. have a date in mind? Well, I would say give me at least five years. Um, I'm not going to release it piecemeal because then you may find yourself regretting things that you said in the first volume by the time you get to the end. So I'm going to wait until the entire thing is written and then hopefully release a multi-volume work. So I'm allowing myself uh, so five to 10 years to complete the project. 
William Nay Craig, this this might be really hard to whittle down, but has there been any highlights over your career? I mean, you have debated people all over the world. You've done lots of yeah. different things. If you could whittle it down, what have some of those highlights been? Well, I think the debate that was really the highlight of my debating ministry was a debate held at the University of Cambridge, at the Cambridge Union, um, which is the oldest debating society in the world. So a tremendous privilege to be debating there. I was partnered with Peter Williams, and our opponents were Andrew Copson and Arif Ahmed. And the uh, proposition under debate was whether or not belief in God is a delusion. This was in the heyday of Richard Dawkins, and so that topic was very uh, hot at the time. And the setting for this debate was what made it so memorable. The Cambridge Union is reminiscent of the House of Commons with benches rising on both sides, and we would sit down in, in the well and speak in the well to these uh, benches of, uh, of the audience. And then there was a gallery circling the entire room up at the top, packed with students. And the debate was a British style debate, not an American style such as I'm used to. And what that meant was that anybody in the audience could interrupt you at any moment with a point of order, and you had to call on a certain minimum number of these people and respond impromptu to whatever they ask. So you really had to be on your toes. And in this debate, you could just sense a lot of emotional bias against uh, the Christian position that uh, Dawkins was so popular at the time, you could sense in the audience that there was a real uh, skepticism. And I spoke second. Peter laid out our opening case, and then I spoke uh, after uh, uh, one of the opponents spoke. And I just had the feeling as I walked in the well, speaking to the students all around me, that that it was like trying to turn a great ocean liner very slowly into a different direction. And um, after the debate was over, the students voted by exiting through two doorways, one marked I and one marked no. And then the uh, counters would tabulate the vote based on which doorway people exited through. And then we, we, we uh, retired to the student bar upstairs and several minutes later, a girl uh, carrying a ledger came into the bar area, ringing a brass bell and announcing the verdict on the debate. And as it turned out, Peter and I won the debate. And so this was just a marvelous, memorable experience of having the privilege yes. of debating at Cambridge. Yeah, I, I remember it myself. Uh, it was part of our reasonable faith tour that you were yes. on in the UK back in 2011. And uh, there were some other very memorable interactions. I, I hosted one of them in London with uh, uh, with Stephen Law. Um, the, yes. the one that stands out more recently to me is, is the marvellous interaction you had last year with Sir Roger Penrose on my Big Conversation series, oh, which was a real treat. Yeah. So, so, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to butter you up, Justin, but that <laughs> was an extraordinary opportunity to talk to a man who was to win the Nobel Prize in physics, one of the greatest physicists of all time, uh, about these deep philosophical questions that arise mm -hmm. out of modern yeah. physics. Yeah. That was yeah. almost a magical yeah. Dialogue. Well, well, I tell you what, if there's someone in the comments on Facebook and YouTube who could post a link to to both of those uh, debates, that I'm sure people would appreciate having the links to them, uh, given that Bill's uh, already spoken of them. But um, let's turn to some of the questions that have been sent in. Uh, Ruth, I think you're going to kick us off, aren't you? Yeah, so there's a huge range of questions, Bill, but this is from Kwaku. I'm definitely going to butcher his surname here. Kwaku Bawating Bawaki Apia. I, I apologise hugely if I've got that wrong. But he asks basically, what if you want to start in apologetics? Where where are some of the places that you can go if you, I, I suppose he's coming from a place of not, not really knowing anything about apologetics. Where are some of the places that you can begin to start with apologetics? I would recommend that you get a very elementary beginner's book and start there. And so I would recommend uh, Lee Strobel's 
The Case for Christ, which, though written on an elementary level, is very substantive in its uh, argument and evidence. Or my own book, uh, On Guard, is intended to be a kind of primer for the beginner in apologetics to equip him to uh, offer a positive defense of the existence of God and God's decisive self-revelation in Jesus, and to answer the principal atheist objections against these arguments. So those two resources I would recommend. Thank you, Bill. Hope, hope that helps, Kwaku. Um, now, Bill, you're, you're well known for your work on the historical Jesus, particularly around the resurrection and obviously the atonement now, most recently. Um, but uh, Chris Losey asks, I struggle with Jesus and the resurrection. The way Jesus spoke, it sounded like he would return sooner than so some of his disciples even thought he would return in their lifetime. So why hasn't Jesus returned yet? Mm -hmm. I think it's very important to see that, in fact, his problem isn't with the resurrection. There, there's no argument there against the resurrection of Jesus. His problem is with the return of Christ, the so-called delay of the parousia, uh, the delay of the return of Christ. And in that respect, I think the evidence for the resurrection can help to um, bolster our faith when confronted with doubts like this. Uh, if we have really good, sound evidence for Jesus' resurrection, uh, as I think we do, that can enable us to hold on to Christian faith, uh, even in the face of the delay of the parousia. Now, I have uh, addressed this in my Defenders class uh, in the section on Doctrine of the Last Things. And what I argue there is that when you look at the predictions of Jesus' return that are found on Jesus' lips in the Gospels, that they're very often, or at least sometimes, taken out of context, and that in the original context, they may not have given that their return would occur soon or during the lifetime of Jesus' disciples. Um, and in fact, there are other sayings of Jesus where he anticipated a very long delay before his return, uh, and that no one, in fact, knows the time of his return. And so I think when you put all of those facts together, it can help us to believe that Christ will return someday to roll up the scroll of human history, bring the universe to an end, um, uh, even though we may not know exactly when this will occur. I suppose just to, to, to kind of come back on that, Bill, I, I, I think a lot of people feel like when the Apostle Paul especially talks about the return of Christ, it does feel quite imminent that he was expecting that within the lifetime of the communities. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps that attitude changed a little in his later letters, as you see him addressing people's concerns about has, has the end come, you know, or, or, you know, what about those who have right. you know, died and so on. And, and he's um, encouraging them that, you know, so, so was it possible that, that there was an expectation, even if it was possibly mistaken among in the early church? Oh, well, I mean, certainly that, that can be true. You know, at the end of the Gospel of John, you remember, the author is very concerned to correct the misimpression that the beloved disciple would not die before the return of Christ. And the author says, Jesus didn't say that. He, what Jesus said was, if um, he should live until I return, what is that to mm -hmm. you? You follow me. Uh, so certainly there, there could have been expectations of that sort. But my point is, uh, are these grounded in the teachings of Jesus? Did Jesus himself teach something false about the imminence of his return? And my argument is that he didn't. Um, and since Paul's beliefs were derived from the teachings of the historical Jesus, I think the same thing would mm. apply there. I personally find that the hardest thing to believe about the return of Jesus is the idea that next Tuesday, say, the universe should suddenly come to an end by the return of Christ. This just seems so unbelievable that something like that could happen. But then in my reading of um, physical cosmology, 
what I discovered is that eschatology is no longer just a field of theology. It's now a field of cosmology as well, physical eschatology. And cosmologists have shown that if the universe is hung up in a kind of unstable vacuum state, that all of a sudden the universe could quantum tunnel to a lower energy state, which would have a sweeping and devastating effect upon the entire universe, bringing about a new set of the laws of nature, a complete dissolution of the universe in which we live. And this could happen tomorrow uh, because it's quantum, it's indeterminate, and nobody knows. So you have this same kind of imminence in physical eschatology mm, that we mm. also have in theology. That's, that's a really interesting point. Ruth, I think you've got our next question. Yeah, so I suppose moving away from eschatology, but still thinking about the theme of death and things like that, Michael Head has a question, and this is actually from the Reasonable Faith Facebook page. He says, if mm. Jesus paid the debt for everyone's sin, then why does anybody go to hell since the debt for their sins has already been paid? Yes. Um, I think that on the basis of Christ's satisfaction of divine justice, that um, his atoning death is sufficient for all persons to be saved and, and pardoned, but that it is on the basis of Christ's satisfaction of divine justice that God offers us a pardon for sin, which we are then free to accept or reject. Just as when uh, the king or the queen pardons someone, that person can refuse the pardon um, and then still be um, held liable for the crimes that he has committed. So a person can refuse the pardon that Christ has won, in which case his death uh, is unavailing for us. So I, I, I don't agree with the Calvinist who thinks of the atonement as sort of a done deal um, at the cross. I think that although Divine justice has been satisfied at the cross. It needs to be applied historically to people's lives as they hear the message of the gospel and respond to God's offer of a free pardon. And they are then free to accept or to reject that pardon. Bill, I've got a couple of questions that sort of carry on from that in, in many ways. And they're, they're on the issue of universalism. Um, mm. The first one is from someone called Mike, who says, um, would you please speak a little towards why you think universalism is untenable, perhaps in relation to David Bentley Hart's new book, And All Shall Be Saved? I don't know whether you've come across Hart's new book. Uh, I, I haven't read the book, but my arguments would be simply biblical arguments. It seems to me that both Jesus and the other authors of the New Testament clearly taught that not everyone would be saved, um, but that those, as, as Paul says, those who receive the free gift of righteousness will um, come to justification and glorification and so forth. So um, I'm told that Jesus warned more of the dangers of hell than he spoke of the promise of heaven. I think the historical Jesus believed that not everyone would be saved. Um, you remember his saying about the broad gate and the wide path that leads to destruction and the many that go in there compared to the narrow gate and the uh, hard path that leads to life. So just honestly, it would be nice to believe in universalism, but I, I don't think that's what the New Testament authors believed in. This is obviously one that, that has a few people interested, though. A, a, another one here asks on the same subject, how do you square God being all loving with exclusivism? And they say, surely if God oh, is all loving, yeah. he sent prophets to all parts of the world, all through history, yeah. and is more interested in love than doctrinal details, i.e. specifically what you believe. Oh, well, I would certainly agree with that. Uh, I used to speak of Christian exclusivism, but then I changed my terminology because I think that that is a prejudicial word. It gives the impression that God is trying to exclude people from salvation, when in fact, I think he's trying to include 
as many as he can. So if you think about it, the opposite of universalism ought to be called particularism, Christian particularism. And so that's the terminology that I now adopt, is that not everyone will be saved, but some will be saved and some will be lost. And if you ask uh, for a defense of Christian particularism, it would be based upon human freedom. I I think that God's will, as it says in 1 Timothy 2.14, is that every person be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, but people have freedom of the will to reject God's love and forgiveness, and so to separate themselves from God irrevocably. And God respects that freedom of choice. Ruth, go ahead. So I suppose staying on the theme of God being a loving God, but changing tact slightly, there's a question here, which I'm sure is echoed by many people. Um, Mm -hmm. This came through on the unbelievable YouTube. And uh, the question is, why did God send COVID? Does he enjoy watching people suffer? Well, I don't think that God enjoys people suffering. I can't think of any reason in the Bible to say that, but neither should we think that COVID was necessarily sent by God. I I mean, it could have been, who knows? Um, But it could be just the result of evil doing. Justin and I talked about this last time, about the carelessness that may have taken place in that Chinese lab that released this virus into the world. Uh, And so this could again be the kind of intertwining of natural evil and moral evil that so often seems to occur. Um, And so we shouldn't necessarily think that this is something sent by God, but certainly we should say that it's something he permitted to happen um, because he could have stopped it if he wanted to, but he permitted it to occur. And I think that whenever God permits suffering and evil in the world, he does so with a view toward a grander purpose that justifies that permission of suffering or evil. If you ask me what that purpose is, I would say that in the broadest terms, God's purpose is to bring as many people freely to salvation as he can, and that it may well be the case that only in a world suffused with natural and moral evil that the optimal number of persons would freely come to find God's love and forgiveness. I I find that not at all implausible. When you look at the places in the world today where Christianity is growing at its most rapid rates, it will be in countries that have experienced terrible natural and moral evil, uh, such as Ethiopia, China, Indonesia, El Salvador, and other places. Whereas in the indulgent nations of Western Europe and North America, the growth rates are pretty much flat. So someone has actually asked me, why is it that God um, has not blessed the nations of Europe and North America with more suffering in order to bring them to Mm. salvation? It may be they that are disadvantaged and not the nations of Africa and and Asia and South America. As as C.S. Lewis famously said, um, Mm. pain is often God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Um, And and I've always found that 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 illustration you use, Bill, very helpful of the fact that... I I think that that is just sociologically demonstrable. As Mm. I say, when you look at those countries in the world where the most people are coming, becoming Christians and the church is growing most rapidly. I think it just gives empirical yeah. evidence to but, Lewis's suggestion. My, my, I mean, my feeling has always been that, that the problem of evil is a problem if, if you've got a particular definition of God. That is, if God is essentially a divine babysitter who should <laughs> never allow us to experience any kind of difficulty or pain, then obviously that's a problem. But if God's job is, as you say, Bill, to bring people to a knowledge of him, then there may very well be ways in which a certain amount of suffering does actually enable us to to meet God in ways that we wouldn't otherwise have been able to to see or hear. And I would want to add one other point that uh, the philosopher Daniel Howard Snyder makes effectively, and that is that the problem is evil, of evil, 
is only a problem for someone who doesn't have any good arguments for the existence of God. But Howard Snyder points out, if you've got good reasons to believe that God exists, then the problem of evil is not a problem. Well, I suppose that leads us really nicely into our next question, because we've got a question okay. here from Daniel Evans, who's an atheist. And his mm. question is exactly about that, about proof for the existence of God. He says, here is my question. I'm an atheist. I'm not convinced that there is one. However, what I'm missing, no, sorry, what am I missing that you have that stops me being convinced that God is real? I've heard a lot of evidence, but nothing's worked yet. Thank yeah. you. Well, now, now that's a psychological question, isn't it? What is preventing him from believing that didn't prevent me? And, and he would be better positioned to answer that question. I mean, ultimately, it's our own sinful dispositions, I think, that lead us to resist God's grace and the message of his love and forgiveness, uh, 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 a concern for our own self-interest and gratification, rather than to know and please God. But I would say that what he needs to attend to would be two things. First would be the inner witness of God's spirit to his own heart. God has not abandoned you to work out by your own ingenuity and cleverness whether or not he exists. Rather, through his spirit, he seeks to draw you to himself, convicting you of sin, um, showing you his love and trying to draw you to a knowledge of himself. And if we will permit him to do that, he will draw us, I believe, into that relationship. And then the second thing would be that there are objective arguments and evidences. I've defended about seven in my career as a philosopher. And when I review these in all candor, I have to say, these are really good arguments. Uh, sometimes I just shake my head in disbelief and say, these arguments are so convincing. Um, it's, it's quite amazing. So I think he needs to attend to some of these arguments that I've defended in books like, say, Reasonable Faith. I mean, one, one thing you've often said, Bill, is that you, you actually feel if you were to put them on the scales, you know, arguments for God and arguments against God, mm. it's actually there's far more arguments for God than if you like arguments in the negative, uh, as it were. But That's right. And weightier arguments. Right. As well it, as plurality of arguments. Yes. Well, we, we do have a question here, though, from Harmony, who says, uh, on the other side of the scale, if you like, what, what do you consider the greatest argument against Christianity today? And how do you respond to it? Well, I think that the best argument would be the argument from the hiddenness of God. The problem of evil among philosophers has kind of morphed into this different question called the hiddenness of God. Granted that God could have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world, why does he seem so distant? Um, why doesn't he make his existence more obvious. He, he certainly could have done that. He could have inscribed on every atom made by God or placed a neon cross in the heavens saying, Jesus saves. But he's not chosen to do that. And so that occasions doubt that he's really there because he seems so hidden. I, I think that's the best argument that the unbeliever has going for him. Uh, and, 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 what, and what is your response, essentially, to, to that argument? I mean, uh, it, it is a good argument. I mean, it, is, it, it mm -hmm. is a pretty, you know, why wouldn't God just make his presence obvious to everyone is, is I suppose, the reason. My response to that would be that God knows what amount of evidence would be sufficient to bring people into a saving relationship with himself, and therefore he has provided such evidence. I think it's so important, as I indicated a moment ago, that God's goal is not to simply get people to believe in him or believe that he exists. Um, God isn't interested in getting people to add one more item to their ontological inventory of the things that exist. Rather, what he's interested in is building an eternal love relationship with people. 
And I think it's not at all improbable that in a world in which God made his existence more evident, say, by putting a neon cross in the sky, that no more people would come to love and know him than those that actually do. In fact, such a demonstration might have made people chafe at his uh, effrontery uh, in doing such a, a, a thing. So I think that God will not allow anyone to fail to find salvation because of lack of evidence. God will provide mm. sufficient evidence to every sincere inquirer to enable him, that person to have rational faith, and that he's not obligated to provide additional evidence if he knew that it wouldn't do any good. I, I should say at this point, just as we're about the halfway mark of our Q&A with Bill, Bill is being thrown the vast majority of these questions completely blind. So you're doing a, a great job, Bill, in, in handling oh, these as we, as we send them at you. Um, if you're watching and you'd like to add your questions, feel free to add them in the comments. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, we've got a great deal coming in. So we won't get to all of them, of course, but we'll try and get to as many as we can. If you want to catch up with today's show, we're going to be putting this out on our Unbelievable podcast as well. Do, do check in the links for more on that and of course you can watch the video back again on youtube and here on facebook um uh, ruth you've got our next question i think yeah bill i suppose in many ways this is linked back to the hiddenness of god and and mm. perhaps the lack of evidence um will on facebook asks a question which i'm sure is echoed by many people and he asks mm. whether it's okay to question our faith oh oh certainly i think it's okay um any person who holds to an intellectual position on anything will at times question whether or not it's true or whether or not he could be mistaken. And at times like these, he'll review the evidence uh, and uh, reassess. And I think that that's a perfectly normal and healthy exercise to do. So. There's no reason to think that uh, we can't raise serious and deep questions about our faith. I guess just as a follow-up for that, are, are there certain things that you would recommend if people really are going through a huge period of doubt? Are there things mm. that you would recommend to kind of help them in that place? Well, one thing I would emphasize is that they must never think that doubt is a purely intellectual problem. I think that there's a spiritual dimension to this as well. And so they mustn't, when they're going through a period of doubt, cease to pray, to read the Bible, to meditate, to go to Christian worship, to fellowship with other believers. The last thing they need to do is to isolate themselves from the Christian community and try to go it on their own. That will be spiritually deadly. So I would say when we're going through times of doubt, it's all the more important to be involved in these spiritual disciplines that will cultivate our relationship with God. And then, as I say, I think it's very healthy to review the evidence. One, that, that's one of the reasons I've participated in these debates on university campuses over the years. I've had the faith that if students could just listen to a debate between a Christian philosopher and an intelligent proponent of the other side, that they would be able to see which way the evidence points and to make up their mind on the issue. And I think that faith on my part has been vindicated over and over again over the years as the case for Christian theism, I think, just stands head and shoulders above any other worldview that someone might care to offer as an alternative. Bill, we're going to turn to a few questions that have come in on another area of expertise for you, um, which is issues around cosmology, the universe. Um, now, um, Dylan Carr has, I think, a, a really interesting question here. He asks, firstly, have you heard of or read Brian Greene's new book, Until the End of Time? Uh, and then I'll ask the rest of the question. Have you come across that book yet, Bill? No, I've read some of Brian Greene's earlier books, but that's not one that I've read. Okay. I am working now intensively, Justin, on this systematic philosophical theology. And so I'm not reading currently. <laughs> on cosmology or the resurrection of Jesus or the uh, fine-tuning argument. I am, I'm focused now on 
this uh, sure. systematic theology. Well, well, I suspect you'll still be able to, to give some, some of a, an answer to, to the rest of Dylan's question here. He says, I heard Brian Greene lecture uh, on his book until the end of time uh, in the same way the first California shutdown went into effect. Uh, when he made his conclusion on a meaningless deterministic universe, it was almost as if someone sucked the air out of the audience because it implied no ultimate hope. And here's how he ended. He said, no final purpose, no ultimate meaning. We are the product of grand processes from the Big Bang. Against astounding odds, we're here. We should have gratitude for the fleeting time that we have on the timeline. We impose our meaning on the external world. Yeah. And Dylan asks, so how would you respond to that, Bill? Well, I would say if atheism is true, he's absolutely right. This is the point that I've made often that if there is no God, then ultimately life is absurd. It's without ultimate meaning, value, or purpose. Steven Weinberg made the same point a few years ago in his book, The First Three Minutes. And so I think we need to agonize with these unbelievers over the implications of the worldview that they've affirmed. It truly is Dreadful. In fact, I would argue, and I have argued, that it's unlivable, that no one can live consistently and happily as though his life were ultimately meaningless, valueless, and purposeless. But note the incoherence of Green's view. We should be grateful, he says, for having existed. Grateful to whom? There is no one to be grateful to on an atheistic view. It's, it's incoherent. It just shows how unlivable this worldview is. Now, what Green doesn't take into account there is the many arguments for the existence of God, such as arguments based upon the beginning of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe, and the applicability of mathematics to the physical phenomena of the universe. I think all of these uh, are better explained on a theistic view of the cosmos than on an atheistic, deterministic, nihilistic view like Green's. We've got another question that, that sort of links in, and obviously this is going back to your well-established work on the Kalam cosmological argument. And I, I know you've answered this question a number of times, but but Nathan asks it, and, and I think it's, it's helpful to remind ourselves mm -hmm. on, on how you respond. Um, firstly, he says, um, why can't the universe just begin without a cause? And secondly, if, cause, if causes are relationships between spatio-temporal events, why would the universe, which is not a spatio-temporal event, need a cause? This, of course, just to set the scene, is obviously related to the Kalam cosmological argument in, you, in which you say anything which begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist therefore the universe has a cause, and then you give reasons yeah. for why that cause is best explained as, as God. Yes. Um, but, but to sum up again this question, why couldn't the universe just begin to exist without a cause? And, and what about the fact that it doesn't seem to have the same kind of properties as other causes which yeah. are spatio-temporal? Well, to speak to the second point first, I think it's an unjustified assumption to say that causality only holds between spatio-temporal events. I can't imagine what an argument for that assumption would look like. And so I think that is an unjustified assumption. Now, with respect to the causal premise of the argument, in my published work, I've given three arguments for the truth of this causal premise, each of which is, I, I think is sufficient for rendering it more probable than not, and which together make a powerful cumulative case for its truth. And these would be, number one, that the causal premise is rooted in the metaphysical first principle that something cannot come from nothing, that being only comes from being. And if that's true, then the universe, being everything there is on an atheistic worldview, cannot come into being without a cause because being only arises from being. Secondly, if things could come into existence uncaused. If being can begin from non-being, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything and everything doesn't come into being without a cause. Uh, and that affirmation would completely destroy science. 
And then thirdly, it would be the inductive evidence that we have for the causal premise. Um, the premise is constantly verified in our experience and never falsified. And so I think we have good inductive evidence for it as well. So we have both uh, philosophical grounds and inductive grounds for affirming that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Bill, this is kind of a follow-up question, but more about the burden of proof. It doesn't actually have a name. Mm. Um, but the question is, what do you think of atheist claims that the burden of proof is on theists to prove God that to prove that God exists, oh. rather than it being upon the atheists to prove that the universe exists without an external cause. So what would you say to that, that actually the burden of proof mm -hmm. needs to be on theists rather yeah. than atheists? Um, anyone who makes a claim to know something has a burden of proof. And the claim that there is no God is just as much a knowledge claim as the claim there is a God. So the person who asserts either one of those has a burden of proof to bear. He needs to justify his claim to knowledge. The person who has no burden of proof to bear is the agnostic who says, I don't know whether God exists or not. I, I, I have no idea. Now, there I'm talking about a soft agnosticism, which is just a confession of ignorance. It's not a view. It doesn't assert anything. It just says, I don't know rather than a hard agnosticism, which says that it cannot be known if God exists. Uh, that hard agnosticism would be a claim to knowledge and would therefore require justification as well. So I think you can see when you think about it that um, really theism and atheism are on a par in terms of bearing the burden of proof for the knowledge claim that each one makes. I've got another question here, Bill. We've got a few technical questions we're throwing at you now, oh. but um, <laughs> uh, this is an interesting one from Christian Rios, who asks, is it possible for logic or reason to exist if naturalism is true? Mm. I, I don't have a strong view about that. I, I don't think that logic is grounded in physical reality in any way. The truths of logic are necessary truths that are known a priori, that is say independent of experience. And so if these logical truths are grounded in any way, I think they would need to be grounded in God as a transcendent being. But perhaps a, a, a Platonist or someone of that ilk might say that if naturalism were true, that the principles of logic are just necessary principles that exist independently of the universe and independently of God. Um, and I'm not sure how one would go about refuting that view. Mm. I mean, on the, on the rationality side, an area that uh, I've been quite interested in is, is C.S. Lewis's argument yeah. against but that's reason, a different question which is a different yeah. question i mean do you yeah, want to no. just briefly spell what that is out and, and why it might present yeah. a problem for believing in both naturalism and and the act of reasoning yeah lewis's argument has been defended with great sophistication by the philosopher alvin planinga who argues that if you believe that naturalism and evolution are true then you have a defeater or, or something that undermines any of your beliefs. Because if naturalism and evolution are true, then our beliefs have been selected not for truth, but for their survival value. And it's perfectly possible for our beliefs to be false, but nevertheless to be conducive to the survival of our species. And so on naturalism and evolution, you have this built-in defeater of the reliability of your cognitive faculties in any of your beliefs. Now, the paradox then is that the naturalist would have a defeater for his belief in naturalism, because naturalism is itself a belief formed by those very cognitive faculties. And so naturalism is self-defeating. It cannot be rationally 
affirmed. Now, this is not an argument that naturalism is false. Maybe naturalism is true, but it's an argument showing that belief in naturalism is irrational. It is impossible to rationally believe in naturalism because if naturalism is true, you have a defeater for all of your beliefs, including the belief in naturalism. And I think that is a very powerful argument. Hmm. I, I, I recently reread Lewis's book, Miracles, where he first set out that argument, which then obviously Plantinga went on to develop as the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Right. And, and I, I was just stunned sort of coming back to it. I read it really in my student days to, I realized he's addressing all of the exact same questions that we're still addressing today when it comes to naturalism. He'd anticipated every one of them. And yes, um, he, he was very prescient, wasn't he? Mm, Lewis was. Mm. Uh, he, he talked about the moral argument for God's existence and talked about the advent of postmodernism and the denial of the objectivity of truth and rationality. He, he was a farsighted man mm, in, in that he understood mm the direction of culture and where things were moving. Yes, he's, he's the, one of the best people to continue to quote, you know, over 50 years from his, his death. Mm. Um, Ruth, let's, let's turn from the technical questions to perhaps, perhaps something a, li a little more down to earth. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a great question that's coming from a 14 year old on the oh. YouTube channel. And he says, Dear Dr. Craig, what answer would you recommend a Christian provide in defense of the more questionable actions of God in the Old Testament? So he gives the example of Jeremiah 13, which it's talking about God causing darkness, causing people to stumble. Oh. But I suppose you could use the genocide passages in the Old Testament or yeah. a number of different things that seem to be sort of questionable behavior from the God of the Old Testament. So how would you respond yeah. to questions about the character of God, I think particularly in light of the Old Testament passages? Yeah, now I think the passage in Jeremiah that he alludes to is being misunderstood here. I think that's talking about God's ability to bring judgment upon Israel or the unrighteous, as well as blessing and flourishing, and that both of these come from God's hand, both judgment and blessing. Now, in the Old Testament, probably the most difficult one is the command to the Israelite army to slaughter all of the Canaanites living in the land of Canaan. And what makes this so difficult is that it seems contrary to the picture of God portrayed elsewhere in the Old Testament, namely, that the Old Testament portrays God as a God of love and mercy, who you'll remember in dealing with Abraham refuses to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah if there are 50 righteous people in the city. And Abraham bargains him down like a Middle Eastern merchant to, I think, 10 people. If there's only 10 in the cities, will you destroy them? And God says, no, I will not. Um, and Abraham says, the judge of all the earth must do right. So you've got this portrayal of God in the Old Testament itself as morally upright, righteous, uh, just, and loving. And that's what makes this command to exterminate the Canaanites so puzzling. And what I would say is that when you look at it in its context, uh, this, this represented God's judgment upon these Canaanite tribes. Um, and he, he says to Abraham early on that the iniquity of these peoples is not yet complete. And so he will not judge them. Instead, he sends Israel into Egypt for 400 years while these Canaanite tribes plunge deeper and deeper into moral degeneracy until finally... After hundreds of years, they were ripe for God's judgment. And if you read contemporary tablets from this period of time, you find that these people were uh, involved in abominable uh, practices, including child sacrifice, uh, bestiality. The things that they engaged in were just morally uh, horrid. And so they were ripe for judgment. And so uh, I think that what God did was that he used the Israelite army as his instrument of judgment on these peoples. Now, what was the judgment? The judgment was to divest them of the land, the land of Canaan. He was 
he, the command was drive them out of the land and I am giving this land over to Israel. Nobody had to be killed if these Canaanites had not stayed to stop and fight. If they had just retreated in the face of the advancing Israelite army, no one would have been killed um, because the judgment was divestiture of the land. The land is what is all important to these Middle Eastern peoples, and God was giving the land to Israel, and these Canaanite clans were ceasing to exist as um, political entities, uh, but th there was no need to kill them all if they had just left. So uh, this represents God's judgment upon these people, a judgment that I think was fully merited. Now, a great deal more deserves to be said about this, uh, and I've written about this in question number 16 uh, on our website in Questions of the Week, and then again later in something like question number 326 or somewhere around there, I address it again. So I'd refer folks to that. And I have to say, I have never seen a refutation of what I have to say there uh, about this uh, episode. People have fulminated over it emotionally. They've denounced it angrily and so forth, but I've never seen a rational refutation of my defense of God's being all just and all loving, and yet his issuing this command to judge the Canaanite peoples. Mm. I mean, one of the greatest critics while he was with us, uh, of course, of God was um, Christopher Hitchens. Mm -hmm. And um, you, man you, of course, debated him at Biola University uh, on one occasion. The question from Jake rather reminds me of Christopher Hitchens. Um, mm. Jake, I imagine, I'm assuming is probably not a Christian, is perhaps an agnostic or atheist and says, mm -hmm. my question for you, Dr. Craig, is how exactly is the idea of worshipping and living with God for eternity in heaven giving you any meaning for what sort of life is a life in servitude? And that, the reason that makes me think of Hitchens is because yeah. he was famous for his sort of picture of God as a North Korean dictator and, right. you know, who would want to worship, you know, and just be in servitude to such a God. And, and that's evidently the picture of heaven um, and the, the life, you know, eternal life that Jake has. What, what would be your answer to Jake? Yeah, I think that the unbeliever doesn't understand who God is. On the Christian conception of God, God is what medieval theologians called the summum bonum, that is to say, the highest good. He is the embodiment, the paradigm of goodness and love and justice. Uh, and therefore, to be in eternal relationship with God is to be in a love relationship that is beyond imagination. It, it is an incomprehensible good. It's an incommensurable good. Finite goods cannot even be compared to it. So not only is our end to be properly found in God, to be oriented toward God, God's own end is found in himself. He's oriented toward his own goodness uh, and nature as the supreme good. And so this is entirely appropriate once you understand the person God is. It is only when you think or misconceive of God as a sort of finite being that it seems improper for him to receive adoration and worship, because then he would not be the summum bonum as he is. Bill, slightly different direction again. This is from a Christian, from Gabriel, and he says, Hi, Dr. Craig, I reverted to Christianity because of your work, and for that I'm forever grateful. However, as I reverted, I felt lost in a sea of denominations, and I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. He says, I feel a kind of anguish over the issue since I don't know what to believe. Catholics say one thing, Protestants another. Some even exclude each other from salvation over doctrinal disputes. How do I know which denomination is true? 
I feel a lot of worry over sanctification, justification, since it seems that some think that the sacraments are necessary for salvation. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to think of this. And then he goes on to say, I know you're writing a book on systematic theology. So I was hoping that you might be able to guide me somewhat in a direction. Thank you for everything you do and may God bless you. It, it certainly can be confusing, especially for a, a young Christian. Uh, and I would encourage him to be patient with himself. He doesn't need to make up his mind on all of these doctrinal issues uh, quickly. And to read, um, say, a book like Bruce Milne's book, Know the Truth, M-I-L-N-E, Bruce Milne, Know the Truth. In this, he will go through things like the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of end times, and he'll lay out what Lutherans and Catholics and Presbyterians and Baptists believe about these things, and you can look at which one you think has the best biblical support so as to make up your mind. Uh, and so I think a book like Bruce Milne's Know the Truth is very helpful in orienting ourselves uh, theologically. I've also tried to do this extensively in my online Sunday school class called Defenders, which is a, a series uh, that goes through the entire uh, syllabus of Christian doctrine, from the doctrine of Scripture uh, all the way to the doctrine of the end times. And in that, I also try to explain to people what do Calvinists believe? What do Arminians fairly as I can before then giving some personal assessment? So he might want to look on YouTube, on our YouTube channels for Reasonable Faith, at these Defenders lectures. There, there are also transcripts of them on the website, which will be much more uh, easily uh, digested than taking the time to watch a, a video. You can either read the transcript or watch the video, but that will certainly help, I think, in making up one's mind about some of these doctrinal questions. And it strikes me, Bill, that, um, I mean, if, if there was the perfect church, we'd all join it, wouldn't we? But it, inevitably... Well, then it wouldn't be perfect. <laughs> well, exactly. That, that's right. the old joke, isn't it? Um, yeah. But but the point is, I, I'm satisfied that I will, when I get to heaven, I'll discover there were lots of things I was probably wrong about. But fortunately, yeah. my my righteousness before God is not based on how good my theology was. Um, it's, right. it's and, and that for me is is significant. We don't it's important to have to try to strive for, for getting our to be doctrinally correct. And, and that obviously helps us in our life and in our witness in the way we relate yeah. to God, but that's not what saves us ultimately. And I, I think you can be part of a worshiping community without necessarily being a full member of that church. When we lived in England, we worshiped in a Plymouth Brethren church, which was a completely new experience for us. Uh, at other times, we would attend an Anglican church, which um, we also enjoyed. Uh, we've attended a Baptist church since moving back to the United States. So I think you can feel at home in a diversity of denominations, even if you don't affirm everything that that denomination stands for. Well, Bill, maybe we've just time for one more. Thank you so much for the generosity of, of your time today. Um, it's been su such a treat to have you for an hour or so to, to just go through as many questions as we could do. Um, I think this is perhaps a good one to finish with, Nate Lee. And I, I don't know whether Nate is a Christian or not, but says um, Nate says, if I just believe in Jesus and his resurrection from the dead, why do I need to live a holy life? If Jesus gives me his righteousness, then what difference does it make if I choose not to go to church or read my Bible or serve others, etc.? If we're going to heaven, as long as we believe in Christ, then preaching about changing our life seems ridiculous, right? Yeah. Well, is that, is that right? What, what do you think? No, <laughs> this, this is related to what I'm currently writing on or, or reading on in my systematic philosophical theology. There's a difference between believing that and believing in. Uh, and salvation does not consist primarily in believing that uh, certain truths uh, are the case. Um, rather, believing in Jesus means trusting in Jesus, committing your life to him as your Lord and your Savior. Now, that will imply certain beliefs that 
that he was the son of God, that he died for your sin, that he rose from the dead. But it's not belief in those propositions that saves you. What saves you is being in relationship with him, having this relationship of trust and commitment. And as a result of that relationship, he produces an inward transformation in your life that the New Testament calls being born again. Uh, it is as though there was a dead light bulb inside of you, and suddenly that bulb has been replaced, and the, the light goes on, um, and you're in a new relationship with God. And then you want to please God. You want to love him, to live a life that is worthy and honoring to him, so that a genuine saving faith is one that will be life transforming. You won't be infallible, but over time, it will change your life. And if your faith is not that sort of life transforming faith, then I would respectfully suggest that this is a dead faith, that it's just a cerebral faith. It's not a genuine saving faith. And, and therefore, um, we need to reassess whether or not we've really come to know God and Christ uh, as our personal Savior and Lord. Mm. Bill, that's a suitable way to, to finish tonight. And uh, if there's anyone watching who perhaps has questions on that, um, then obviously feel free to, to look further over at the Reasonable Faith website, reasonablefaith.org. Uh, there are great a number of articles and videos and resources there both at the scholarly level and at the lay level there's something for everyone um also feel free to uh, go to the unbelievable webpage premierchristianradio.com forward slash unbelievable to explore more about the show and to, to see the many shows that bill has contributed to over the years there as well in our archive um all of the links to both uh, reasonable faith and unbelievable available from the info with today's video but Bill, can I just say thank you so much for giving up your time today and um, oh. uh, and give give our love to Jan as well. Who... I will. It was a pleasure, and uh, I wish you and Ruth and Peter and all of those uh, at Unbelievable a happy Advent season. <laughs>